So welcome to everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to see so many of you attending this session of the Science for Peace Forum. I also see uh, quite a, a few na new names, which is, is very good. Uh, so for those of you that not, do not know me, uh, I'm Pierre van Michelen. I'm a professor at the University of Antwerp, and I'm active as a particle physicist at CERN. I've been working together with, with Hannes, with Hannes Jung for, for many years. Uh, and unfortunately, Hannes will not be able to stay on for this meeting, so he has asked me to chair uh, this session. Uh, as there are a few new people logged on, I should perhaps describe the context of uh, Science for Peace uh, a little bit. So this, this forum was, was initiated by a group of scientists, mostly experimental particle physicists who were very concerned about how international scientific collaboration was affected by the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in the context of, of CERN, where we are active, we are used to a very close collaboration between scientists from a very different background. And examples that are often given are Israeli and Palestinian, Palestinian students participating in the CERN summer student program, or scientists from Iran and the United States uh, working together in the same physics working groups, for instance. And this is something that, that, that we treasure and that we are quite proud of. So, Science for Peace, for me, it means uh, that to, through common scientific interest, which is often purely fundamental, connections are made between very different people, people talk to each other, and that results in, in a mutual understanding that benefits all of us. And actually, uniting people from all over the world is uh, part of this official CERN mission. So I think this can be an example for, for the rest of the world. And even during the Cold War, I remember from my uh, former thesis advisor, uh, scientists from the East and the West were talking to each other, sometimes in very difficult circumstances, but it still happened. And, and today, Russians and Ukrainians are, are working together at CERN in Geneva, including the, in the CMS collaboration where I'm myself part of. So with the invasion of Ukraine, this collaboration came under heavy external and also internal pressure. Um, there were sanctions imposed by governments, funding agencies, institutes, uh, and this meant banning Russian scientists from conferences or Russian students from, from schools. And in the CMS collaboration where I participate, scientific publications were suspended for more than a year just because we could, simply couldn't reach a consensus on who should be on the author list and with what affiliation. So the Science for Peace Forum was then created as a place where we can discuss all these issues and where we can inform each other of measures imposed in, in different countries. And some of the actions that we have been taking include petitions. First, there was a petition to stop the escalation spiral. And then there was a second petition to refrain from using nuclear weapons. And also there we got support from, from several Nobel laureates that, that also signed this petition. Uh, we, have read, we have written letters to heads of state, to institute directions, et cetera. Sometimes we get uh, replies, which, which uh, are sometimes very positive also. And some months ago, we organized a, a virtual panel discussion with, with leading scientists. So today, I, I'm, I'm happy that my colleague from the University of Antwerp has accepted to give a presentation on the war of Ukraine. And um, well, there is something that is called the fog of war. And that means that it's something sometimes very difficult to, to understand what is really truly happening. And well, what we know for sure is that, that many Eastern European countries willingly and knowingly joined NATO and that Russia invaded Ukraine and uh, many unspeakable atrocities followed that. Uh, but beyond that, things are very confusing and the events that happened over the last weekend only confirm that it's really very, very confusing. So I hope that Tom uh, can bring us uh, some, some clarity in all this. Uh, Tom is an expert on the matter. He's a professor of international politics at the University of Antwerp. He's also a member of the Bookwise Conferences and has received the Rotary Alumni Global Service Award. Uh, he's active in various peace organizations in Flanders and abroad. Um, so just as a reminder, this presentation will be recorded and it will be made available on the Science for Peace website. Also the slides presented by Tom will be available on the, on the website. Um, with this, uh, I would like to hand over to Tom. So I'm looking forward to his presentation. And after the presentation, we will have some time for questions and, and discussions. So Tom, please, if you can broadcast your slides. slides and yeah. start. OK. Thank you, uh, Pierre. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well. OK, so I will start sharing my screen. <clears throat> 
So uh, let me ask you also to mute yourself. I see that merrily and Hans uh, have not muted themselves yet. So. Okay. Do you see the, the PowerPoint? Yes, yes okay. you can see. Yes, okay. So, um, as uh, Pierre said, I'm, I'm a political scientist. I'm an expert in, on nuclear weapons originally. But of course, um, due to the war, we have to follow this. <laughs> and um, I've written a, on, on, on this war a couple of articles and I would like to share my ideas. Uh, these are, of course, not the truth. Uh, it's uh, just my own analysis. And um, it's a starting point for the debate afterwards. I would like to start with the following um, elements. Um, it's clear that this war by Russia is not only immoral and illegitimate, but also illegal, uh, going against all the rules of the international order um, and were established after the Second World War. Uh, the consequences of this war are most uh, felt by the people in Ukraine, uh, as we can see on television every day. But what is lacking, according to me, um, is um, peace initiatives uh, by the international community. And as a result, um, because of the lack of these initiatives, the war may go on for a long time. And we should also ask our uh, the question, in whose interest uh, is this war? And what strikes me in the media, in the mainstream media in Belgium, but uh, I've been told that's the same in the Netherlands, in Germany, in France, and probably in many other countries, that the war narrative is dominant. What do I mean with the war narrative? That there's just one culprit, uh, um, that's uh, Russia, and not only Russia, it's Putin. Yeah? Um, the victim, that's basically the Ukrainian people, and the solution is rather simple, and we should stand behind Ukraine. We should give them humanitarian aid, of course. We should uh, help the refugees coming to Europe, but also um, providing intelligence, uh, weapons, arms deliveries, and more arms and uh, bigger arms, no, tanks. Uh, and, and, and the next one uh, in line is um, F-16s. So where does it end? Huh? And Russia has to lose, and that's the that's also part of this war narrative, due to um, economic sanctions. Uh, the, Russia should leave the annexed uh, regions and go back to to uh, Russia, and Ukraine should uh, become member both of the EU, which is which has been promised, uh, and also NATO, which also has been promised. So, uh, who is saying this? Uh, basically. Yeah, the majority in our countries, uh, uh, if you read the surveys, because uh, the mainstream media is providing this view, uh, and it's partly based on emotions, uh, uh, also on idealism, um, human rights, democracy, uh, and, and uh, especially the German Greens uh, are uh, at the forefront uh, of this idea. But it's also the, the United States uh, and our governments in Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, France, um, all NATO member states and EU member states follow this line. Eh? Um, the historian Timothy Snyder is an intellectual, an American intellectual, who um, defends this position. And you can also argue that's not only about in, uh, idealists uh, or values, uh, but also about deep interests uh, involved, and especially the interests of uh, the United States. So the criticism is uh, on this one narrative that that's my criticism that's reductionist and rather simplistic and secondly that it's very dangerous because we uh, should not underestimate the motivation uh, uh, of putin why he started this war and uh, i will come back to that it's a, it's a major question that we have to deal with today uh, also, if we want to find a solution to this war, we have to understand Putin's motivation. And uh, it's extremely dangerous um, 
especially if Russia is pushed into a corner, is pushed back um, out of Ukraine, then uh, in my view, and not only in my view, uh, many nuclear weapon experts uh, believe that the scenario that he may use a tactical nuclear weapon on Ukraine uh, is a possibility. Yeah? I'm not saying that it's likely, but it's a possibility, and that's worrying. So what is lacking is a peace narrative. And what do I mean with peace narrative? That the culprit is not only Russia, yeah? um, but also we in the West, we have made mistakes in the past. I will come back to that. The victim is not only the people in Ukraine, but also in Russia, many uh, parents are losing their sons. Yeah? Um, and in Africa, people have less food uh, due to the war. In Europe, there's inflation. Um, so the whole world loses because of this war the solution uh, according to the peace narrative is of course to support Ukraine because it was Ukraine that has been attacked uh, let's be clear about that uh, so it can defend itself and, and should not lose or, or not lose too much uh, and uh, the peace narrative also um, requires a diplomatic initiative leading to negotiations for a peace agreement. And that peace agreement will be a compromise in our likelihood. And according to me, uh, and again, I'm not the only one, um, I think the core element of that should be a neutral Ukraine. So that should not become a member of a Western alliance nor a part of an Eastern alliance. Yeah? Um, the Crimea probably will stay Russia. Um, it's not ideal, I know, but de facto uh, it will probably stay um, Russia, maybe not the Yure. And eastern Ukraine, uh, that depends on the fighting that's going on. Um, I will come back to that at the end of my presentation about the solution. So who is also um, providing this analysis? People on the right, like Henry Kissinger, uh, 100 years old, um, Noam Chomsky on the left, uh, also uh, in his 90s, in Germany, Jürgen Habermas, also above 90, <laughs> so many wise people, uh, IR scholars in the United States on the right, uh, realists like John Mersheimer from Chicago, Stephen Wald from Harvard, uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, from uh, Columbia University. Then people from the Quincy Institute, like Anatole Lievin uh, in Washington. And in the Netherlands, uh, my colleague Jolle Demers from Utrecht. In France, Emmanuel Thau. Um, there's also an interesting uh, publication by the RAND uh, think tank in the United States uh, that's related to the Air Force, uh, uh, who called for prudence. And basically the whole global south. Uh, uh, that means China, India, uh, Turkey, um, basically Africa and Latin America, they are not following the United States and the EU um, with respect to sanctions, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Yeah? Now, of course, we should criticize this uh, peace narrative as well, eh? and, and it has been criticized. And what I hear is that, uh, okay, first of all, that will not uh, succeed, eh? a peace initiative. But then my, my counter argument is we have not really tried. Yeah? We should at least try to um, bring the two parts together yeah? and put pressure on them as well. And we can put pressure on the Ukraines. Others can put pressure on Russia. Another criticism is that yeah, if we end up with such a solution, a kind of compromise, then yeah, those who initiated the struggle, uh, the attack, the war, Russia, will win. Yeah? And that's not fair. Here, my answer is, uh, that's correct, uh, uh, and I do not like that either, but uh, international politics is not fair, uh, or is not always fair. Uh, um, and secondly, also we in the West, we have uh, made mistakes, and so the result is that the final solution will have to be a compromise. Uh. So the basic question for today is, how can we explain the behavior of Russia? Uh, and here there are three possible explanations, three theories, if you want. Um, one theory, and that's the, the mainstream theory, uh, says that Russia acted uh, to become bigger. Yeah? It lost territory after the, the, the Cold War. Uh, 
uh, USSR imploded, uh, Russia is, is the leftover and is smaller and it wants to become bigger as again, eh? expansionism, some say imperialism. You know? Another reason, completely different, um, why Putin attacked or Russia attacked Ukraine is that it has to do with domestic politics. Eh? In the sense that the Kremlin is afraid that democracy existing in Western Europe, now also in Eastern Europe, uh, is exported to Ukraine. And if that happens, maybe it uh, will also uh, go to, to Russia. And then if that's the case, the people, people uh, in the Kremlin currently have to leave. And that's not what they want. So they try to prevent it. So that's another explanation. And a third explanation, again, completely different, is that it has, has not to do with power or with domestic politics, but with security. Yeah? And more in particular, with a feeling of insecurity in Moscow um, because of NATO expansion. Yeah? Uh, let me just uh, develop uh, these theories very shortly. Uh, and, and one I will uh, expand more in length. Uh, the first one uh, is, for instance, defended by the former defense minister of Poland, Radislav Sikorski. And uh, they refer to uh, 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 the history uh, of war, where big states annex parts of smaller states. Uh, um, they refer to Hitler. Uh, Putin is compared with Hitler. <laughs> and uh, some also refer to cultural, historical explanations uh, that's in the genes of the Russians to act like that like that and if you uh, really uh, like this theory then uh, of course you can kind of predict that russia not only will occupy ukraine but will go further west uh, and try to occupy smaller states like the baltics uh, that have been part of the soviet empire before now i personally do not uh, agree with this uh, theory uh, we should be very careful with historical analyses. Uh, Putin is not Hitler. Um, I have not seen much Russian expansionism after the Cold War, except the Crimea yeah, in 2014, but not much else. Um, and in my view, Putin had not the uh, ambition to occupy the whole Ukraine. Um, he had not the means, uh, only 200,000 troops. You cannot occupy a country like Ukraine with 200,000 troops. Uh, I think in my view, he had the um, goal to uh, have another re uh, political regime installed in Kiev, uh, closer to uh, Russia uh, than the case today with Zelensky. Um, in addition, he has not, and Russia has not enough power, uh, both economic and military speaking, to be able to attack, annex, and occupy um, other states, including Ukraine and the Baltics. If you just look to the, the power indicators, uh, territory, uh, population, on the left, uh, you see in green the European population, we are 500 million, including the UK, um, Russia 165 and shrinking. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> On the right, uh, on the bottom, you see the economic uh, difference. And these are old numbers, so the numbers are even um, more unequal today. Uh, but you see that the GMP uh, of Russia is smaller than, than Germany alone. Huh? Um, probably today, Russian GMP is as uh, big as Belgium and the Netherlands together. Huh? Um, EU is much, much bigger, huh? more powerful, you can say. And if you look to defense expenditures, and that's something that you don't do not see, uh, do not uh, on television, or do uh, do you not hear on the radio, or you do not read in your newspaper, but Europe alone spends 300, 350 already a billion dollars a year on defense. Yeah, you can add the United States defense budget, which is 850. So we end up with. In NATO, NATO, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Atlantic, Atlantic Alliance, with one thousand two hundred billion dollars per year spending on defense, yeah? and then uh, if you then look to the number of, of Russia defense, uh, it's much 
much smaller. It's, uh, it was 60 billion and it's nowadays 85 billion dollars. Of course, in Russia, you can uh, buy more with this uh, 85 than in, than in Western Europe or in the United States, but still the difference is huge. Huh? And um, those who fear that uh, Russia will will uh, steam to uh, Eastern Europe and Western Europe and occupy the whole of Europe, yeah, that it's it's an illusion. Huh? That, that, that Russia is not able to do that based on these uh, numbers. Okay, the second theory, uh, the democratic. Uh, politics, um, the domestic politics theory is, for instance, uh, defended by Michael McFall, who was the ambassador of the United States in Moscow and is now associated with Stanford University. Um, and these people refer to the so-called color revolutions that you may remember. Uh, those in Georgia, Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan, 2003, 2004, 2005. Um, and these uh, revolutions were organized, financed, partly by the West. And, and we should ask the question whether that is a smart idea to do so. We can come back to that uh, in the Q&A. So uh, let me uh, dwell further, and, and uh, I want to explain this third um, explanation, third theory about security more in depth. And here I have to explain something uh, about international politics, international relations. And if you say international politics, then we basically talk about the big states uh, most of the time, uh, the great powers, and uh, especially the security constellation amongst these great powers. Uh, today, we are talking about China, United States, Europe, Russia, uh, maybe Japan, uh, and that's it, uh, or India. So uh, there are different security constellations imaginable uh, between these great powers, going from world war, which is uh, uh, the, the least um, uh, desirable, going to interstate war, balance of power, and I will uh, come back to these um, concepts in a minute, collective security, which is more idealistic and better in my view, a security community, what is a security community? A security community is a community of states that do not fear each other. Yeah? Uh, some people uh, believe that that does not exist, eh? that states always have to fear each other. I can give you some examples eh, of security communities like the Scandinavian countries. Eh, they, do not, they do not fear each other. The Benelux countries, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, we do not fear each other. Uh, the whole EU, the European Union, is a security community. Yeah? And if the world would become a security community, um, yeah, then uh, I cannot. I probably stop teaching my course on international security, yeah? but that's not going to happen in, in the short term. And ideally, we should strive for sustainable, uh, positive peace, yeah? durable peace. But uh, the flower power, uh, that's for a long term. Um, <laughs> so I, I will come back now to the two most uh, used security constellations in, 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 in reality, balance of power and collective security. Let me explain these two. Um, balance of power, yeah, well, does that mean that um, the idea is that the power of states determine the order of the international uh, political order? And they, uh, these states, these big states, need power for survival. Huh? Um, and you can see in history that some of the states uh, have not survived. Huh? So uh, we are living in a dangerous world, huh? these realists say. And power fluctuates on a permanent basis huh? between these uh, big powers. And it der that determines the hierarchy amongst these great powers. Um, these are temporary and unstable so-called balances of power, and may lead to miscalculations uh, and conflict, violent conflict and war, uh, like history shows. Um, if you choose for this kind of security constellation, you need weapons uh, to defend yourself, um, arms racing, and ideally, certainly for smaller states, alliances, uh, or uh, in another name, collective defense organizations. For instance, NATO uh, is an alliance, a collective defense organization meant to uh, defend the member states against an external threat. Yeah? Um, I will come back to that later on. Also, the idea of sphere of influences and buffer states 
Yeah? Um, that's also now coming up with Ukraine. Uh, uh, as Russia sees Ukraine as a kind of buffer state, is part of this language. Uh, now, uh, if you remember uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, um, at that time, the United States didn't like the fact that the USSR uh, came to America uh, and the, the, the Soviets had to go back as soon as possible. Uh, it's part of the Monroe Doctrine that says that um, both North America, Middle America, and Latin America, South America, um, are dominated or should be dominated by the United States. That's the US doctrine. So that means it's their sphere of influence. And yeah, in parallel, you can make the argument that Russia now considers Ukraine as their uh, spheres of influence buffer state. Collective security, that's the other uh, major security constellation, is a bit more idealistic yeah? and, in my view, better, more stable. What does that mean? Um, and here you see the key word, cooperation. Yeah? That these great powers do not only cooperate in, on economic terms, uh, trade, investment, but also security-wise. Yeah? Um, Despite, despite their power inequalities. And you can see in the world, uh, we have not only collective defense organizations like NATO, but also collective security organizations, uh, uh, the United Nations and the OSCE, the Organizations for Security and Cooperation in Europe, are examples of uh, collective security organizations in which the member states uh, agree on rules about the war and peace and also have a kind of a defense system to, to protect themselves against each other and not against an external uh, threat, but against each other. And that's a fundamental difference between uh, alliances like NATO and uh, collective security organizations like the United Nations or the OSCE. In such a collective security order, there is no place for alliances. Uh, you, don't, you don't need alliances because you're protected by these collective security organizations. There's also no need for sphere of influences or buffer states because you have made some agreements uh, on war and peace with the other member states. Of course, you need arms, but less than in a balance of power constellation. And according to me, um, this is a more stable uh, security constellation it's because it has a kind of safety net that the balance of power system does not have. And there's less chance for misperceptions, miscommunications, and miscalculations. Now, this was the most difficult part, so let's come to uh, the history <laughs> and look how it worked in history. And um, I'm not the only one saying that it's very difficult to move from one security constellation to another, except after a world war or a big war, yeah? or a cold war. Um, because after uh, such a world war, many people ask the question, why have so many people died? Uh, in the first, first world war, 10 million people. In the second world war, 50 million people or more. Why? Yeah? And then uh, politicians and people, public opinion, would like to do it better. And they have the opportunity to uh, move to a better security constellation, another world order, if you want, in the form of a peace treaty um, that may then establish these collective security organizations. And let's have a look uh, to the history of the last 200 years and see when we did it well and when we, didn't, uh, we did not do it well. Um, after the Napoleonic Wars, we did it well. Uh, why? Um, I will explain it immediately. But a basic element is that we included the loser of that war. Yeah? And the loser of that war was France. And France was um, invited to sit at the table yeah? afterwards. Um, the, the big great powers in Europe came together, diplomacy, yeah? uh, in order to prevent a kind of empire, uh, Napoleonic empire um, coming up again. I will um, immediately come back to that uh, and explain it further. After the First World War, we, uh, yeah, we failed uh, because uh, the loser of the war, Germany, uh, was uh, not accepted in the order. Uh, um, and after the Second World War, we did it better. Again, Germany and, and lost the war uh, together with Japan, but 
Germany and Japan were included in the world community. Yeah? So, and that led to stability and peace for decades, same as in the 19th century. So uh, let me again come back to the, to the, the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Uh, we established a kind of concert European, a collective security system in Europe. And that led to stability, security, and peace for decades, which is which was unusual for that time. Yeah? So the system worked also because we included France, the loser of that war. Um, after the First World War, um, the great powers were not, all of them were not um, invited. Yeah? This so was uh, not a good beginning. Uh, Germany was excluded and had to pay. Yeah? And that was perceived as das Diktat in Berlin. Uh, and the result was <laughs> instability in Germany and uh, the Weimar Republic, uh, Nazism and Hitler, um, and the start of the Second World War. <clears throat> and again, a balance of power gain. Uh, we, <clears throat> we did it well. We did well by uh, establishing for the first time a kind of collective security organization worldwide, the League of Nations. But the League of Nations um, architecture was not uh, established too well, although we made some mistakes. And later on, the United Nations, the successor of the League of Nations, uh, in '45, did it better. We, we learned our lessons. So uh, after '45, uh, again, um, we uh, included the losers. And so that led to stability and peace for decades. Uh, the United Nations was uh, set up, and uh, the United Nations is still alive, uh, maybe not kicking. You have can have a lot of criticism, but uh, imagine a world without United Nations. I think we should then immediately uh, re-establish that organization. Yeah. So the basic question for today is how did the international community act in 1891? And we had two possible, possible scenarios. Yeah. Integrate Russia in a new uh, regional collective security organization, uh, Russia that had lost the Cold War. And by doing so, that would yield stability and peace, uh, just like in 1815 and uh, after the Second World War. Or we could exclude Russia uh, and fall back uh, again in a kind of balance of power game, including spheres of influence and alliances. And that would yield stability and war, according to my theory and according to the history. So what did we choose huh, in 1891, in the beginning of the 90s? And here we have, uh, you, and you probably know the answer, huh, uh, we choose not to integrate Russia huh, on an equal level. We excluded Russia. Huh, and that, uh, of course, is at the origins of the problems that we know today. Here you have the uh, American president in 1990, a couple of months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, already saying no other organization can replace NATO, so collective defense organization, as the guarantor of Western security and stability, despite the fact uh, that the Soviet Union uh, would implode uh, a couple of months later or a year later, and the same for the uh, Warsaw Pact. So the question, was Russia interested in joining NATO? Yes, yeah. Gorbachev raised this point, Yeltsin raised this point, and now you will be surprised, but President Putin in 2001, he was one year in, uh, in office here in Brussels, uh, asked the question, can Russia join NATO? And the answer was three times, no, no, no. Yeah. So um, in that case, yeah, you could, of course, predict that there will be conflicts coming up. Uh, there will always be conflicts, also in a collective security um, order. But again, if you have a collective security order, you have a safety net uh, to better deal with these conflicts. If you don't have this safety net, you end up faster in war. Yeah? So what went wrong in the 1990s? We had problems in the Balkans uh, where uh, Russia uh, was close to Serbia and we uh, were close to the others, the frictions. Later on in Kosovo, uh, we even fought a war, uh, NATO war, um, without the UN Security Council resolution, by the way. Uh, 
against the rules of the international order. And four years later, the same in Iraq, without a UN Security Council resolution, against the rules of war, against the rules of, of the international order. Uh, so all, all this uh, Russia didn't like, of course, because Russia is part of the UN Security Council and has a veto right uh, in principle uh, and also de facto. Now, the biggest problem was that NATO, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, continued to exist, despite the fact that uh, the counterpart of NATO, the Warsaw Pact, was imploded. Uh, it imploded in, in 91, stopped to exist. And that's normal that alliances after a war or after a cold war stop to exist. Yeah? Uh, there is no need for alliances in peacetime. Yeah? Look to the after the first world war, the alliances stop to exist. After the second world war, the alliances stop to exist. And after the cold war, the Warsaw Pact stopped to exist. So the fact that NATO continued to exist is very difficult to explain. Yeah by international politics, by theories, uh, and it's kind of aberration in world history. Yeah? Um, I will come back to that. You see here uh, how uh, the blue territory, NATO, uh, was small and grew, uh, expanded, expanded to the east in the direction of Russia uh, after the Cold War. The Soviet Union imploded, Russia beca uh, became left over, and in the middle, you see a very important state, a big state, relatively big state um, to European standards, Ukraine, uh, between the East and the West. Um, in addition, we had promised not to expand NATO. Yeah? Promises made in the framework of the German reunification talks in February 1990. Uh, Germany, Helmut Kohl, wanted to reunify East and, and Western Germany. France didn't like that because Germany would become the, the number one in Europe. Uh, uh, England didn't like it and Russia didn't like it either. Yeah? So uh, the Germans knew that they had to come up with something yeah, to convince Gorbachev uh, um, that he would agree with German reunification. And uh, they did come up with the promise not to expand NATO. Uh, only Eastern Germany would become part of uh, Germany and therefore become part of NATO. But all the other states in Eastern Europe would not become part of NATO. These were promises made to Russia uh, in February 1990 on more than one occasion, uh, be it uh, oral promises. For instance, here you have a speech by Hans Dietrich Genscher, uh, the liberal West German Minister of Foreign Affairs in uh, Tutsing, I believe it was the end of January or the beginning of February, saying it's for NATO to declare unequivocally, irrespective of whatever happens with the Warsaw Pact that still existed uh, until 19, uh, at the end of 1991. There will be no expansion of NATO's territory to the East that is closer to the borders of the Soviet Union. Yeah? Such security guarantees are important for the Soviet Union. And a week later, there was a similar um, declaration by uh, Jim Baker, yeah, the US uh, Foreign Secretary, Secretary of State, to um, Gorbachev and Chevernadze. And after um, hearing these uh, assurances, Gorbachev basically gave the West, West Germany, what Kohl later called the green light for German reunification. Yeah? Um, and what we, did we do? Yeah, um, we uh, united Germany and later on, a couple of months later, uh, or a couple of years later, we um, also expanded NATO against our promises, yeah? completely against our promises. So try to imagine yourself uh, sitting in, uh, in, in Russia, yeah? Um, you would not have liked that either. And apart from the promises of NATO expansion, uh, there were a lot of people, experts, academics, but also people in government against NATO expansion because they knew that this would lead to problems with Russia. Yeah? And you can read the names, uh, George Kennan, which is probably the best known American diplomat after the Second World War, was against this idea. Uh, Paul Nitze, another one, uh, the General John Galvin, I will quote him immediately. Here you have him 
four-star general. Um, he has been uh, chief of, of uh, NATO, Sakur, here in, in Belgium. Uh, he retired, and then uh, he said, in 95, in the mid-1990s, we won the Cold War, but we are losing the peace after the Cold War. Yeah? There's no doubt in my mind about it. We do not think about Russians enough, about whom they are, what they are doing. We don't think much about the way they think of us. We should consider folding NATO in a bigger organization, that, uh, like I was explaining. We need a whole new organization that brings the Russians on board. Yeah? But uh, President Clinton uh, did not uh, like that idea of the general or mine idea. Eh? And so he decided to expand NATO in the 1990s, first with Poland, Hungary and Czechia, and uh, later on uh, another 10 countries, including the Baltic states. Yeah? So the, uh, all this uh, Russia didn't like. Yeah? And uh, the betrayal continues from the point of view of Russia. Uh, despite the fact that Putin was the first leader to call Bush after 9-11, for instance. Yeah? So he was not anti-Western right from the beginning. Yeah? Uh, he, uh, Putin helped us uh, in Afghanistan yeah? in October, November 2001. So he was not anti-Western from the beginning. Yeah? And as a result, yeah? or not as a result, but uh, the, the Americans withdrew from the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, in December. Yeah? Something that the Russians didn't like, because it undermined the nuclear deterrent um, of uh, the, the Russians. And then there was this uh, axis of evil speech and the war against Iraq. So the Bush administration um, yeah, didn't make life easier for Russia. Yeah? And Russia also felt betrayed by the European Union, by the way, already at that time. Uh, here a quote by Karaganov, uh, um, a Russian uh, strategist, of particular annoyance to Russia's political class, where systematic deceits and hypocrisy, broken promises and declarations that the very idea of the existence of spheres of influence in world politics was outdated and no longer corresponded to modern realities and concepts. The West, however, never missed a chance to expand its own ostensibly non-existent sphere of influence. Um, here we have a quote by uh, the British National Security Agency uh, chief, Francis Richards. He said, we were quite grateful to put in support after 9-11, but we didn't show it very much. I used to spend a great deal of time trying to pers persuade people that we needed to give as well as take. To give as well as to take. And I think the Russians felt throughout that on NATO issues, they were being fobbed off, you know, and they were. And so, in my view, Putin uh, probably changed his attitude um, into around 2003, uh, maybe a year before or a year after, but that was the period when he, he stopped believing in collective security, in cooperating with the West. Yeah? And uh, at, from that point onwards, he also falls back on this balance of power thinking, yeah? hard versus hard. Yeah? And uh, the economy, of course, helped him with uh, gas and oil prices rising. And in 2007 at the Munich conference, he spoke out. Yeah? And Merkel was there in the first row and, uh, of course, didn't uh, like the, what he said. And Putin basically said what I just said uh, about NATO expansion. And we also see the first cyber attack by Russia or in world history uh, uh, against Estonia in the same period in 2007. And then the biggest mistake, of course, is still to come. Yeah? At the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008, you see uh, in green Merkel, and you see maybe uh, you can recognize uh, Bush. Um, what was on the agenda? Yeah. Ukraine, membership of Ukraine and Georgia in NATO. And this, this was a big red line for Russia. Russia didn't like the previous uh, expansion rounds, but Ukraine for Russia was sacred, yeah? very important. Um, it was a, regarded as a buffer state. Yeah? Remember that both Napoleon and Hitler walked through Ukraine until the outskirts of Moscow. Yeah? So the Russians uh, had some uh, negative experiences with Western Europe over the last 200 years, and they wanted to prevent it for a third time. Yeah? So that's why they see Ukraine as a kind of buffer state. Again, uh, buffer states are not needed if you have a collective security system, but that's something that the Americans didn't want to establish after the, after the Cold War. So we fall back to balance of power and, of course, uh, that includes buffer states. 
uh, there were a lot of mixed marriages between Eastern uh, Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, in the, the Russian language uh, was spoken in Eastern Ukraine, also in Southern Ukraine. I've been to uh, Odessa a couple of times. Many people speak Russia. Uh, we speak Russia over there, also in the Crimea, and even in Kiev. Yeah, uh, a lot of people uh, spoke Russia. There was the granary of the USSR, uh, missiles were produced over there, and of course, statistically very important, the port of Sebastopol. Yeah? Um, and here you have the ambassador of the United States in Moscow, right before that summit. Yeah? And he said uh, to his president in the form of a cable, U Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. Yeah? Because we focus on, as a laser beam on Putin, his thinking is or was shared by many people um, in, in Russia. Uh, if we would have seen another president, that president in Russia would also have um, acted against Ukrainian membership in NATO. Yeah? And he predicted Russia will react. Yeah? The guy is now the CIA director in, in the United States. And Putin was present at that uh, summit in 2008, and he won't at that uh, meeting yeah, to Bush, if you do that, if you include Georgia and Ukraine, if they are admitted to NATO, then Russia could separate the Crimea and the eastern part of Ukraine. So he basically predicted what he would do later on yeah, in 2014. But Bush didn't want to listen. Yeah. Um, and uh, went against the will of the Europeans because Merkel didn't like that idea neither because Merkel knew that if he would allow Ukraine into NATO, that would give problems in Russia. Um, but Bush uh, really pushed the Europeans at the summit uh, to the limit. And we finally had to agree, apparently, uh, but I think it's a fatal mistake. Uh, that Georgia and Ukraine will become member. Yeah? So the red line crossed and Putin was very angry and he's still very angry. Yeah? So if you want to understand why Putin attacked Ukraine, you have to go back to this episode in history. Yeah? Um, then uh, only a couple of months later, Russia provoked Georgia into a war. Now, that should have opened our e uh, eyes. Yeah? But it didn't. And then we got um, the Maidan and the Crimea crisis in 2013, 2014. And that was not caused by NATO, but by the EU. It was the EU that wanted to include Ukraine in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah? Uh, the EU proposed trade and association agreement negotiations in 2013. And uh, Yanukovych, who was uh, the president in Ukraine, uh, and, and more Russian-minded, uh, uh, agreed, yeah? and he spoke out, and the people in Ukraine, of course, loved that idea. Yeah? Uh, they wanted to get rid of these oligarchs and, 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 and the corrupt system in Ukraine and wanted to become a member of the EU. Yeah? Um, but uh, Putin, of course, didn't like that, and uh, apparently the EU had not thought about Putin and Russia, uh, just to focus on trade issues, apparently. And um, Putin then uh, proposed a better deal for Ukraine, more money at the end of uh, 2013. And then Yanukovych um, switched to the other side, to Putin. And of course, disappointing many people. Yeah? And you get uh, these uh, protests on Maidan with West European leaders speaking out. Uh, you remember that? But they were not there anymore when 100 people uh, were shot down, uh, shot um, and were killed. Uh, after which the president Yanukovych fled to Russia and Putin invaded uh, the Crimea and, and also started the war in eastern Ukraine. That's, um, that's the history. So the interim conclusion is that, the, and here I cite my colleague, Professor Stefan Wald from Harvard, Ukrainian crisis uh, did not start with a bold Russian move or even a series of illegitimate Russian demands. It began when the United States and European Union tried to move Ukraine out of Russian orbit and into the West's spheres of influence. Uh, Russia is not an ambitious rising power. It's an aging, depopulating, and declining great power. Yeah? And the failure of US diplomats to anticipate Putin's heavy-handed response, he says, he continues in Ukraine, 
uh, was an act of remarkable diplomatic incompetence uh, because many experts had predicted this, uh, George Kennan already in the 1990s. Here we have the NATO Secretary General, a Dutch guy, uh, Jadorp Scheffer, who was present in 2008 uh, with that decision. And afterwards he said, I think indeed that we have under underestimated the Russian humiliation. Uh, it's about perceptions and perceptions matter. Uh, this is not a legitimation of Putin's actions, but and, and the same for me, uh, I'm not legitimizing Putin's actions. Uh, I'm also, I'm only trying to understand why Putin acted as he did. Uh, but he continues, Yadorp Sheffer, uh, I do say we could have acted more intelligently with respect to the Russians. So that was the NATO Secretary General, uh, retired. Here you have an EU official, <laughs> but not with name, uh, without a name. Russia never said it wanted the sphere of influence in Ukraine. If they said so, we would have approached the issue differently. My goodness. Um, yeah, here, um, that's also interesting, what Ivan Krastev uh, has to say. That's uh, one of the most important uh, philosophers nowadays. He is from Bulgaria. Bul um, and he, um, in his book, The Light That Failed, um, makes the following comparison. Yeah? He says, the West supported the secession of Kosovo from Serbia. Yeah? Then later on, Russia supported the secession of the Crimea from Ukraine. What's the difference? We supported the color revolutions in the neighboring states of Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, you remember? And now Putin is supporting the extreme left and extreme right political parties in Western Europe. What's the difference? We lied about NATO expansion. We said it would, we would never expand NATO, but we did. Uh, he lies about the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so what's the difference? Uh, we were happy after the implosion of the USSR. Yeah? The Russians were very happy after the Brexit. What's the difference? Uh, we intervened in Iraq, they intervened in Syria. And now the most important uh, uh, element is we did it first. Yeah? We give the bad example and the Russians copy pasted it later on. Yeah? So I think we should have to do some introspection um, as well. Yeah? And uh, then later on, uh, I'm very going very uh, quickly through history now, the Ukraine became more and more Western even when they were not the, the Yuri part of, of NATO, uh, but de facto, Ukraine became more and more an, uh, an, uh, close to Western uh, and, and American, uh, the American order under Obama, but even more under Trump uh, with the export of deadly weapons for the first time. And uh, that continued un, uh, until the Biden administration uh, with an important strategic partnership agreement in November 2021, uh, a couple of months before the start of the war. Um, and why did Putin make that mistake? Yeah, because he, uh, he, he made a mistake by invading Ukraine. He expected a, a, a victory, uh, but um, that didn't happen. So he, he miscalculated. Why was that? Um, he was probably misinformed by his intelligence and, and by the army. Um, he was living isolated because of COVID. Uh, and he saw a weak West. Uh, the West was weak. Um, President Biden, his health, um, domestic problems, the withdrawal from Afghanistan in that summer. Uh, Merkel was gone. Uh, Merkel was the only one with whom he had a close relation. Uh, they, they talked uh, the same language. Uh, um, and um, yeah, uh, Ukraine became more and more uh, under influence of the West, uh, also militarily, and he didn't like that. He was afraid, probably, that he would lose Eastern Ukraine. Yeah? And if that would happen, Ukraine could become a member of NATO. As long as there would be fighting going on on the East, uh, of course, NATO could not incorporate Ukraine. But um, yeah, then he invaded the, the, the country. I'm not going to defend that. Uh, it was, uh, it's going against all the rules of international order. Uh, I'm just trying to understand what happened. Uh, I think we have to do that in order if we would find, uh, we would like to find the solution in the end. Uh, this is the war going on. I'm not going to into detail. That's uh, the current situation. 
uh, the future and then I close um, the worst case scenario and we can uh, continue in the Q&A about this is that uh, we should we will push Russia back into a corner uh, that Putin would not like. Yeah? He's not going back to his office and say, oh, sorry, I, I made a mistake. That's not what's going to happen. No way. Yeah? Uh, he will defend until the bitter end. And uh, in the worst case, he may use may do things that we do not like yeah? in the form of uh, using nuclear weapons uh, or maybe first doing a nuclear test uh, and so on. Ideally, both parties, Ukraine and Russia, should understand that they have more to win with speaking, talking, diplomacy, than by fighting. Uh, of course, there are some spoilers. Uh, some people and some groups are winning uh, the defense industry, uh, for instance, especially in the United States. Uh, there should be a ceasefire as soon as possible, and then negotiations uh, leading to a peace agreement. What should be in the peace agreement? Um, Ukraine can be uh, a sovereign and democratic state may be a bit smaller uh, maybe not uh, let's, ideally not but uh, it should be realistic yeah. um, a neutral ukraine that's very important for russia yeah? so no membership of nato no foreign troops in, in uh, ukraine and security guarantees from both the east and the west yeah? ukraine can trade with east and west yeah? and eu uh, membership is possible in the medium term or long term if all criteria are fulfilled yeah? Uh, it's already proposed by Ursula von der Leyen, a bit uh, uh, too soon, I believe. <laughs> and uh, with respect to the territorium, the Crimea probably will stay Russia de facto, uh, not de jure. And the east of Ukraine, uh, yeah, that will depend on the fighting that's going on. Uh, uh, ideally, it should go back to Ukraine, uh, uh, like the Minsk agreements had proposed, uh, but they were not executed, and then international control. But it may be uh, that uh, Russia would like to stay, uh, um, and then uh, Ukraine has to decide what to do, uh, to go on fighting or to accept that uh, situation. Afterwards, uh, Ukraine should be helped with the reconstruction, also by the West, and the uh, economic sanctions uh, against Russia will have to uh, be uh, uh, relieved, uh, suspended. And in the longer term, and that's very important, uh, we should include both Ukraine and Russia yeah. in uh, the another uh, and, and more stable Euro-Atlantic collective security system. Yeah. And this is the last slide. Um, I think the peace narrative should prevail instead of this war narrative in the mainstream media. Yeah. The war should be halted as soon as possible. We in Europe should look much more to our own interests uh, instead of the American interest, for instance. Um, and we should, and we haven't talked about China, but uh, let's do it better with China in the future than with Russia in the past. Sorry for going on so long, uh, but now I open it up for questions and uh, remarks by you. And I will try to stop my uh, sharing my screen. Thanks a lot, Tom, for this really very nice presentation and arguments. Um, 